but all of these will be recorded and available uh, for viewing later as well. Okay, we're not starting yet. I'm gonna tell you a story. We set up a YouTube channel, the Gunnison Valley Producers Guild. And because we're all volunteers doing this for the first time, it's, it's coming together really well, but um, we keep forgetting to hit the record button. So if you do find our YouTube channel, we start the record button on Eric McPhail's talk on Thursday night, right when he has a slide up of manure. So what is just an amazing uh, kickoff of our YouTube channel uh, and the whole Producers Guild event is a slide of a pile of manure. So I think that's great. I'm a farmer, I love manure, um, but it was pretty auspicious, I thought. All right, it's five after, so I'm just gonna uh, welcome everyone who's here. Hello, everyone. Thanks for attending the seventh annual Farm to Table Conference. It's hosted by the Gunnison Valley Producers Guild and the Western State Colorado University Center for Cold Climate Food Security. Uh, we are gonna begin at first with a land acknowledgement. Um, a land acknowledgement, it's a formal statement that recognizes and respects the indigenous peoples that existed as traditional stewards of this land that we're on. Um, we recognize that, um, we recognize the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and their traditional territories. So here in Gunnison, we reside on Ute Mountain, Ute and Ute land, and we thank the people, peoples that have lived on and cultivated this land uh, historically since time immemorial. It's important that we seek to understand the history that has allowed us to be successful on this land. And if you know of other tribes or peoples that we should acknowledge, feel free to place those in the Q&A box. So this conference is being recorded and you'll have an opportunity to view the presentations on the Guild's YouTube channel. We'll send out links to that after the conference. We'll also send out PDFs of some of the speaker's slides. And we'll send out the Local Foods Cookbook in about a week. So there is still an opportunity for you to submit your favorite recipes to share with others using vegetables, meat, eggs, herbs that thrive in the Gunnison Valley. And those will be included in this first edition of our Local Foods Cookbook. And today's conference runs from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. with a break for lunch from 11.45 to 12.15. You can leave your Zoom connection on during lunch if you wish, um, and that way you won't have to log back in again. Uh, but after the keynote, we offer two different tracks. Um, and you can stay on this Zoom link, Zoom room for track one. You can log out and follow the second link for track two. And the links are shown on the schedule that Dana emailed each of you. And, and you can go back and forth between those two Zoom links at any time. If you're interested in, uh, uh, watching different presentations. So we'll likely turn off this chat box for the keynote presentation. And during the regular sessions, you can ask questions in the chat box or use the Q&A uh, box. Um, and in the uh, uh, Zoom room version, track two, I think you can turn on your microphone and video at the end of the talk to ask questions. If you're not speaking um, and you see your microphone on, you please mute yourself and turn off your video to preserve bandwidth and, and hearing. So our goal for this conference is to provide you with actionable information to help you become food independent. We wanna give you a sense of agency and a sense of urgency for creating food independence in the Gunnison Valley. Many of us are feeling the urgency as our industrial food system experiences supply chain disruptions, severe weather effects on crop production and economic uncertainty. So if you're feeling this sense of urgency, we want to impart a sense of agency. By that, we mean agency is that you have the power to not, and the knowledge to visualize and create a more resilient food system. So as you listen to these presentations today, you might wanna write down a list of 10 things that you could do to improve the food independence or food sovereignty for you and your family. And then I'd suggest you narrow that list of 10 things to three things and you say, I'm gonna do these things this year, this summer. I'm gonna do them now. I'm gonna grow some kale. I'm gonna make some sauerkraut. I'm gonna sign up for a CSA. I'm gonna volunteer at a community farm. Okay, that's four things, but um, let's just do what we can. Um, and together we can take steps toward food sovereignty in our valley. 
And uh, here to talk more about food sovereignty is our keynote speaker, Dr. Adrian Fielder. Dr. Fielder is the Assist Assistant Dean of Instruction at the Colorado Mountain College North Fork Campus. And among his credentials are, he has a PhD in Comparative Literacy, Literacy and Cultural Studies from Northwestern University. He was a Fulbright Fellow in Morocco from 1999 to 2000. He has expert certification in global environmental education from Cornell. He has a national certification in community organizing. He has wild crafting certification with the Roaring Foragers. He has an MA in Francophone Postcolonial Studies. He has a BA in Comparative Area Studies from Duke University. He co-founded a Bachelor of Arts in Sustainability Studies in 2011 at Colorado Mountain College, and he is a wholehearted food sovereignty advocate. We're very grateful to Dr. Fielder for speaking at our Farm to Table conference. The title of his talk today is Drawing Down to Dirt, Regenerating Our Food Shed for the Great Transition. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Adrian Fielder. Thank you so much, Sue, and to your co-conspirators uh, for catalyzing this event seven years running. That's quite an accomplishment. Congratulations. Uh, and also thank you to Dana and the folks at the Center for Cold Climate Food Security for helping organize. And to all of you out there in Zoom land for your beautiful presence and your curiosity. I've already enjoyed the other talks uh, I attended and really appreciate this as one of those COVID silver linings of Zoom connections across space that um, maybe spark new relationships we will soon get to cultivate in person. So my talk, I changed the title just a little bit. It's still the same. I'm gonna And it is Reclaiming Food Sovereignty by Regenerating Our Food Sheds. So food sovereignty is our right to feed ourselves, uh, each other, and future generations. And the threats to this right are many. And never in human history, I believe, uh, has it been more imperiled than it is right now. Uh, we'll look at the dangers in this talk because we need to know what they are, clear-eyed. Uh, but I want to focus on solutions. So uh, first I should tell you what I mean by a food shed. Just like a watershed is a region uh, shaped by the cycle of energy exchanges through which water flows, a food shed is also a system through which energy and resources flow. In this case, from soil to plate, to body and back again to soil. So here's a diagram of a food shed that highlights how resources pass through not only the agricultural, but also the social, the economic, and political contexts in which we make choices about how to live and eat, uh, and of course, how to grow our food or forage it, ferment it, and use it to feed our families and communities. So I'm coming at you today from Carbondelet. So I reached my hand way up over McClure and Kevlar Passes to salute those of you who are in Gunnison. Um, I'm right in the middle of the Roaring Fork watershed that brings life to food producers who in turn bring life to thousands of people up and down the Roaring Fork Valley. So inspired by this idea, uh, our friends at Crimpy, uh, Fat City Farmers and the Farm Collaborative have defined a Three Forks food shed, encompassing producers throughout the Roaring Fork watershed, the North Fork watershed, and the Middle Colorado watershed. And they've created the Three Forks Academy to provide training in regenerative agriculture at farms throughout the area. Um, but when we peek over Kevlar Pass, we see you too, Gunnison Watershed. Uh, which begs the question of whether our bioregional food shed is actually made up of four forks or even more. 
Main point is that food sheds are tied to the land and its people, and hence are a, a local or regional phenomenon. So how do we regenerate them in order to reclaim our food sovereignty? Forgive me if I state the obvious, uh, but I have uh, distilled a few principles into a notebook, which I share with you via this slideshow. So the first principle underneath all the others is to look to nature as our model. And that's because over 3.7 billion years, uh, she's already designed solutions to all the problems we're facing. So let's model our solutions on what works and has proven to work over the long span of time, which means we should diversify at every scale and dimension that intersects with our food shed in order to build resilience. Diversity and resilience uh, make any system better able to heal from any calamities, um, whereas loss of diversity does the opposite. So just as any crop infestation uh, is gonna multiply like wildfire when your entire field is planted with just one species, a monocrop forest provides a huge supply of food perfectly suited for the one parasite that specializes in attacking that species. So when you see a mountainside turned completely orange from beetle kill, this is usually because it was planted with lodgepole pine and only lodgepole pine after the original forests were logged. The mixed forests uh, that we have in the Roaring Fork Valley, uh, which suffered less logging, are generally more diverse and have thus succumbed less to the pine beetle than a lot of other areas in Colorado. So uh, this basic principle drives the very evolution of life on Earth. As organisms respond to disturbances, ecosystems that are more homogenous get wiped out, while those with more diversity survive. And that therefore increases diversity over time. So this diagram of the tree of life shows the development of all lineages of organisms known to science over time since the beginning of life. So imagine that you're in the center of the circle, looking outward, starting here with the earliest single cell prokaryotes, over here in red between three and four o'clock. The story of life becomes steadily more complex as you spiral outward and clockwise all the way around to the youngest organisms like us uh, who co-evolve within ecosystems that are increasingly diverse. So why do we need diversity? Uh, simply put, uh, it's necessary for life. Lack of it leads to destruction. Ultimate case in point is the source of all life, where the fiercest battle uh, for our food sovereignty is being waged as we talk, and that of course is seeds. We humans have learned how to tap into this remarkable gift of evolution to receive a huge variety of food blessings. Noting the characteristics that present over time as plants evolve, uh, indigenous farmers developed in endless varieties of corn in Mexico, potatoes in Peru, tomatoes in Italy, and on and on. You know this story. But modern capitalism has had a devastating effect on biodiversity, both by endangering thousands of species of wild plants and animals, uh, and by drastically reducing the number of crop varieties being marketed and therefore produced. Uh, this simplification dumbs down the resilience of these plants to adapt to disturbances such as pest attacks or rapid climate shifts. That's just in 80 years, folks. It also puts control of the food system into the hands of a decreasing number of increasingly powerful corporations that are exceedingly adept at avoiding accountability for their actions. 
So we shouldn't be surprised to see the same simplification process uh, when we look at the epidemic of corporate consolidation that's happened over the past couple of decades in the food sector. Uh, this figure actually presents the inverse pattern from the tree of life diagram as the logos in the center are the big 10 food corporations consuming the diversity of smaller companies on the periphery through acquisitions and mergers. Uh, this is exactly the opposite of what Adam Smith envisioned when he first described capitalism. He hated monopolies, but that's what's happening. Uh, we see the same pattern occurring in the organic food space as rising stars get gobbled up by the big ag giants uh, dominating the industry. But there can be uh, no food sovereignty without seed sovereignty. So the recent purchase of Monsanto by a pharmaceutical giant Bayer is a, a threat to all of us. As uh, Vandana Shiva warned us, uh, once they have established the norm that seed can be owned as their property, we will depend on them for every seed we grow of every crop we grow. If they control seed, they control food. They know it. It's strategic. It's more powerful than bombs, more powerful than guns. So this is, I think, the penultimate example of a structure of domination that my Colorado Mountain College colleague, Tina Evans, uh, in her book, Occupy Education, uh, has termed enforced dependency, uh, by which she means a reliance on external resources uh, that is, according to her, characteristic of our age of late capitalism uh, really throughout the world. So to provide a model for how to subvert the empire of seed domination, Dr. Shiva founded a farm cooperative called Navdanya, where Indian peasant women have lifted themselves out of extreme poverty uh, by growing their own seed stock and root stock so that their entire region can remain self-reliant rather than dependent. Her work gives us hope that we can reclaim this sacred heritage of humanity, as does that of other seed warriors like Winona LaDuc, who led her Ojibwe people to fight back against Monsanto's attempt to patent the genetics of wild rice. I kid you not, uh, Mother Earth's precious gift to the Great Lakes region. They tried to make it into intellectual property. Uh, and Winona LaDuc and the Ojibwe won, by the way. So don't miss out on opportunities to exchange seed with your neighbors, such as the annual North Fork Valley Seed Swap next Saturday in Paonia. Also uh, consider basalt, where the public library's collection uh, includes not only books and such, uh, but also seeds grown the previous season by local farmers and gardeners. So how it works is uh, you check out seeds in springtime, you grow, out, grow out your crop, and then let some of the best specimens go to seed so you can return your loan at the season's end, uh, bringing the seed library another step forward and being uniquely adapted to the local climate. If you don't have time to create a seed library, you can at least source your seeds from a professional land race farmer who develops progressively more localized seed genetics by identifying specimens uh, presenting the most beneficial adaptations each season and bringing them to seed. Uh, in my neck of the woods, uh, which is actually the Roanoke Valley, uh, Casey Piscura of Wild Mountain Seeds is doing just that in a microclimate not too different than the Gunnison River Valley. It's kind of tucked up under Mother Sopris in a way. Um, and I hear Laura Parker is working similar magic uh, at Buckhorn Gardens in Montrose. May these examples uh, remind us that we are all seeds. So let us diversify our communities as well. This requires zooming out to think beyond agriculture, uh, to diversify our local mountain economies. Uh, to create opportunities in a variety of fields. As for the food shed specifically, uh, we need to create markets for a variety of products and services. And to supply those markets locally, uh, we should foster a wide diversity of people, 
organisms, and uh, ways of thinking. A great model for this, uh, I think as our conference organizers realize, is the guild. A simple example of which is provided by the familiar Three Sisters companion planting. In uh, permaculture design, we define a guild as a cooperative assembly of organisms who, feel, uh, who fill um, various ecological niches that together produce abundance. Since all guild members benefit from pollination, for example, you'll want to include species with long-lived blooms to attract pollinators uh, throughout the season. Since uh, plenty of insects like to eat the same fruit and leaves we do, a guild should also have insectary plants like yarrow to provide habitat for predatory wasps who are really good at keeping the pest bugs in check. So once you get this guild concept, it's not hard to imagine other services that support the common good, whether that be erosion control from prodigious ground creepers, shade or wind protection from hedgerows, or plants who feed fungal allies in the soil, or birds in the sky who bring us fertilizer, pest control, and free seeds. But we have to intentionally design our grow spaces to accommodate such diversity. So give your local NRCS office a call and ask them about their cost sharing programs at times, uh, they reimburse farmers up to six grand for planting hedgerows and up to one grand in seed bunny for pollinator friendly perennials. And well placed hedgerows slow the movement through your site, uh, the movement of wind, that is, um, cutting down on moisture loss and uh, providing habitat for tons of critters who can keep your farm or, or garden ecosystem in balance. Um, and if you're lucky over time, they might even be able to keep out the deer or keep them on one side of the hedgerow. The same concept applies to social spaces as well. When we design our organizations and our projects inclusively, we increase the number and variety of economic niches that can coexist in our community and in our food shed. A hot topic right now is social permaculture, where we create human guilds. I'm sure you know, uh, for example, someone who has the effect of attracting metaphorical pollinators into our social spheres, bringing new people into the food movement. This is a job we need people to do, just like we need pollinator plants in our gardens. So let's fund it. Some folks are more like shade plants good at keeping things cool and protecting others. Make them our moderators, our peacekeepers, our elected officials. Still others excel at keeping things organized and in place like ground cover. Let's hire them to be our farmers market coordinators or our community grant administrators. Some can do that magic trick of drawing sustenance out of thin air by partnering with underground allies, just like lagoons, whose roots provide room and board to specialized bacteria able to fix nitrogen. Let's get them jobs as community organizers and connectors in chief. Still others uh, produce just the right medicine. So let's book them as our herbal healers and shamans on demand. Which brings us to our Next principle for reclaiming food sovereignty, and that is to get high on our own supply, by which I do not mean substance abuse, uh, but rather the opposite. Let's break our dependencies by localizing our food shed into a circular economy fully integrated into a closed loop. Uh, we need to get away from linear production systems like the one you see on the left, since they depend uh, entirely on expensive resources trucked in from elsewhere. And they create a mess of pollution as well alongside whatever outputs they were trying to produce. Of course, this model is embodied by industrial ag, which imports fossil fuels 
fancy machines, patented seeds, and energy intensive chemical inputs that altogether destroy the ability of the soil food web to produce its own biofertilizer. Why would you want to do that? Uh, thus creating a literal addiction to those chemicals. Oh, I see. And of course, also causing massive pollution downstream with um, unfortunately ecocidal consequences. By contrast, closed loops take any byproducts on the back end and plug them back into the system as inputs, thereby creating a circular flow of resources in which there is no waste because everything is food for something else. An elegant model for this is provided by John Todd, who designs artificial wetlands called living machines to treat sewage and other wastewater high in nitrates and phosphates. A handful of US cities are starting to make night soil in this way, such as Tacoma, Washington. But this might be a hard sell to use for sewage in your hometown. Uh, but the same concept could certainly be applied to keep agricultural runoff out of our streams by planting riparian buffers and downslope catchments with plants like willow that are really good at sucking up excess nutrients. And this would save our towns the considerable expense of expanding the denitrifying capacity of their wastewater treatment plants. So bring this idea to your town councils and county commissioners. They'll like that idea of saving tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, for an example that's suitable for any size growth space, I share with you my own social permaculture plant persona. I am the quintessential mulch plant or a dynamic accumul accumulator. So just like our superstar comfrey here, uh, these plants tend to have long tap roots that dig deep into the subsoil where they partner with fungi to accumulate diverse minerals into their bodies. Uh, like them, I also seek partnerships with a large cast of characters who are tapped into extensive mycelial networks. And through that, I've amassed a diverse collection of resources and perspectives, not to hoard them, uh, but to share with neighbors and family and friends. Uh, here's a table showing dynamic accumulators with the wide array of nutrients they absorb. Precisely because they take up so many different minerals into their bodies when they're alive, uh, when they decompose, they turn into food for a wide variety of soil organisms. In the wild, uh, they would die back in autumn and over winter, the critters would go to work eating the leftovers uh, to build up new soil. But in permaculture, we try to accelerate this natural process by chopping and dropping. That is by harvesting leaf matter from these plants and spreading it as a top layer of mulch, which retains moisture and feeds our target crop as the mulch rots into new soil organic matter. Similarly, on the human dimension, uh, truly diversifying our food shed means going out of our way to get to know people who look different from us, who speak another language or come from other cultures or backgrounds. To open your heart and your mind to such cross-pollination, consider hosting volunteers from other countries or from big cities uh, to work on your farm or garden. By becoming a woofer host, you can uh, explicitly invite people from other cultures or folks who have diverse experiences or skill sets. This is an easy way to bring in new perspectives and fresh melodies into your heart song. Another, of course, is to spend time with children. So reach out to your local school or daycare to open your grow space to them. They desperately need this, especially as we come out of this pandemic. And you could benefit too. So the catalyst for the international transition movement, Rob Hopkins' most recent book uh, is called What Is, From What Is to What If, and it's great. Uh, in it, he examines the ways that people around the world are reclaiming their collective imagination. Uh, and as he shows, this is easier said than done. 
as the most powerful technologies of our time are perfectly designed to turn us into passive consumers who have no idea where food comes from or how to produce anything. And kids are most at risk of this robbery of our imagination. And uh, connecting youth to soil is really the most valuable thing we can do right now to recruit the farmers of the future. Here's my dear friend, Elaine Pevec, uh, who was going to join us today, but I think she had uh, duties to welcome a new grandchild into the world. Uh, she's a wizard of school and community garden organizing. Um, and in her book, Growing a Life, uh, she shows how spending time gardening literally changes youth's brains and hearts, making them calmer, more focused, and capable of creative thought, uh, more interpersonal, and best of all, more hopeful. On this note, I've heard great things about you folks at Mountain Roots Food Project, and I look forward to learning more about your work later today. But the most important way to power a circular food economy is to leave it in the ground with it being carbon in the form of plant roots, mushroom mycelia, microbes, and soil organic matter, which are the pathways through which carbon enters the soil from the atmosphere. This means a few things, starting with what we choose to cultivate as food crops. And here we need more perennial polycultures. Like the guild example discussed earlier, uh, perennials provide a number of ecosystem services, including that all important work of sequestering carbon, moderating temperatures like trees uh, with their microclimates that they produce, uh, and stabilizing the earth's overall climate. And when we do plant annuals or pulse crops, let's put away our plows. No-till opens new dimensions of fertility, whether you tend a garden or a farm of any size. Here's a no-till seed drill that can plant hundreds of acres. If you're skeptical of no-till, and even if you're not, uh, please read David Montgomery's book, Growing a Revolution, which explains the science well and visits with no-till farmers uh, operating in every climate and at every scale. One of them is this guy, Dwayne Beck, director of Dakota Lakes Research Farm, a large acreage farmer in South Dakota, uh, whose success with no-till converted his very conservative neighbors uh, in a region once infamous for epic dust storms, which are now drastically reduced since they adopted no-till. So now they sit around the kitchen table and geek out about mycorrhizal fungi. So whenever uh, soil is plowed, this wondrous underground network of nutrient cycling is literally chopped into a million pieces. Not only are the mycelia upended along with the roots, so are their many allies from microbes to nematodes and protozoa to arthropods and earthworms and so on. In this experiment, the sample on the left includes only bacteria and fungi, but not those larger soil fauna, whose activity greatly speeds up this, this process, as you can see on that sample on the right. So uh, to avoid harming all those organisms, wise farmers also avoid compacting the soil. So for example, everything with wheels on Dwayne Beck's farm uh, has big fat tires inflated to just 11 PSI and only seven PSI if the ground is wet, all to keep from compacting it. If you have a degraded site where the soil food web has been destroyed by plowing, compaction, chemicals, or any other assault, Fear not, a simple but powerful way to regenerate the food soil, soil food web is to brew uh, actively aerated compost tea and then apply it to your land. So this I'm showing you is a simple home system that I use in my garden, uh, but there are big brewers for larger scale operations. 
uh, at CMC, my campus is actually Spring Valley. We don't have a campus in North Fork yet, but that would be great. I would move there if we did. Our groundskeeping crew has three of these tanks running full tilt to treat our highly degraded acres. To learn more about uh, how to create uh, fertility with the soil food web, take a class with this woman, uh, Elaine Ingham, Dr. Elaine, uh, or attend a conference hosted by her soil food web school, uh, such as this one. It starts on Monday and runs for a few days. That's this week. Uh, Dr. Shiva is there, Dr. Ingham, and a lot of other great folks. John D. Liu. So it can sometimes feel lonely to be a soil geek, but healthy soil is not just an academic matter. It's very much an economic one as well. And this is about to change the conversation of food sovereignty. Several generations ago, the amount of organic matter in the soil literally set the price of agricultural land. Every farmer knew that soil dark and carbon rich humus was more fertile. And guess what? So did their bankers. But as our society has lost connection with the land, we, we seem to have forgotten this ancient truth. But we have every reason to expect that to change in our lifetimes. And that's because the economics of the situation dictate it. So imagine, uh, for example, you're an investor and I asked you to underwrite my business. You would probably wanna see a business plan comparing the cost of running my operation to the value of my product. If I told you my overhead was 10 times the value of my output, you would be wise to decline my proposal to invest. Well, when we consider return on investment in terms of energy, that's precisely the business model of big ag. As you can see in this diagram, showing the amount of energy used to power the industrial food system on the left versus the amount of energy actually produced by it. So this begs the question, why hasn't this system already crashed? Answer, because it's been underwritten by an enormous fossil subsidy of two kinds. The first kind is financial as national governments and private investors have directly subsidized the fossil fuel industry to the tune of trillions of dollars per year. The other subsidy though is physical and is due to the fact that fossil carbon compounds during their formation over millions of years uh, became incredibly energy dense. So one barrel of oil contains about 1700 kilowatt hours of work potential compared to just 0.6 from an average human workday, which means one barrel of oil contains about 10 and a half years of human labor equivalents. As such, these uh, fossil workers are thousands of times cheaper than human labor. Applying fossil energy to tasks that humans used to do manually or with animals has generated a huge invisible labor force subsidizing modern civilization. Inspired by Buckminster Fuller's vision of all the horses it would take to power the engines around him on the highway, graphic artist Stuart McMillan's comic Energy Slaves helps us visualize the fact that the average American has over 250 energy slaves working for them 24-7. That is the labor equivalent of 250 human workers working around the clock every day of the year. These two subsidies together are the main reason why it's cheaper in current dollars to grow an industrial tomato in Mexico and ship it halfway around the world than it is to produce a carbon-free tomato grown regeneratively and sold at the local farmer's market, even though it takes much more energy to produce the industrial version. This market distortion is an example of what financial analysts call the carbon bubble, which artificially props up the value of carbon emitting sectors of the economy by giving them an unfair advantage of free labor over those with a more responsible carbon footprint. But just like the previous dot-com and housing bubbles, investors know that the carbon bubble is bound to burst as this invisible labor force is about to become much harder to come by. 
I'll get back to this in a moment. Meanwhile, uh, this bonanza is cooking our goose. This analysis of the world's greenhouse gas emissions blames agriculture for 13 and a half percent of the total, uh, which you can see as the purple ribbon here towards the bottom, second from the bottom. But this study isolates one small part of our food supply that is on farm production without looking at the whole food system. But when we account for all the energy needed to create the infrastructure of the industrial food system, we start to see a more alarming picture. For example, building factory farms requires energy from several other sectors outside of agriculture. The same goes for commodity monoculture, which requires huge chemical inputs and drives the biggest land use changes, including devastating loss of forest in the Amazon to grow soy or in Indonesia to grow palm oil, et cetera. Similarly, when we account for the food miles that grocery store products travel through globalized commerce networks, we have to include a chunk of the tra transportation sector. Even more energy goes into food processing, storage and retail, and all that silly food packaging. Plus the whole system is being powered on the front end by fossil fuels, which have to be mined and processed. Uh, and on the tail end, there is a huge amount of food waste that goes into our landfills where it becomes methane, a potent greenhouse gas hundreds of times more powerful than CO2. So I've long suspected the industrial food sector is the number one culprit in climate disruption, which would mean that reforming it could be the biggest leverage point we have in the, flight, the fight to uh, stabilize our climate. But until recently, uh, there was no proper systems analysis of that question. But I'm happy to report uh, my suspicion has been vindicated now by hundreds of earth system scientists assembled by Paul Hawken, who worked for years to produce Drawdown, uh, perhaps the most important book of our age, which examines the 100 most promising strategies for reversing global warming and ranks them according to three metrics. First of all, their drawdown potential to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. Secondly, uh, the cost of implementing each one. And thirdly, the money savings that would be accrued by each one. So here's a peek at the most effective solutions ranked by drawdown potential. You'll see in just the top 20, quite a few that I'm willing to bet you have not heard discussed much, if at all, by even the most climate progressive towns and institutions. It turns out that wind and solar farms are important pieces to the puzzle, but they're outnumbered quite a bit by the drawdown potential of community development solutions like family planning or educating girls and food-based solutions like eating a plant-rich diet. Or how about this one? Cutting food waste by half of present levels comes in at a whopping third highest drawdown potential. Not, not eliminating food waste, just cutting it by half. So um, here I group this, the solutions by sector. I, I know it's hard to read the words, but you can see that uh, food system related solutions constitute the vast majority. The green ones on top are leave it in the ground production methods like those we just discussed. The yellow ones after that include energy and water efficiency measures applicable on small farms. And the pink ones are land use improvements that would be optimized by regenerative ag. So crunching all that uh, data, I was stunned to realize that regenerative food production alone constitutes a third of the total drawdown potential of human civilization. And if you include the other food related sectors, we can achieve two thirds of our potential to reverse global warming simply by retooling our food system. So let's flip the script on the story of our footprint by having it follow in the proverbial footsteps of the gardener. And folks, this is where to place our bets. What gives me most hope in this data uh, is how it reveals the financial impetus to invest in regenerative practices. 
check out how the net cost of enacting all those solutions is $8 trillion if we act now. And this would save the world $30 trillion by 2050. Even without any public funding from governments, that $8 trillion is totally doable. The investment class has become extremely wary of the impending carbon bubble bursting, which they fear will be more calamitous to the financial system than the mortgage-backed securities collapse of 2007. And so they're divesting from fo the fossil economy as we speak. Since January of last year, the world's largest asset managers, JP Morgan, Citigroup, and BlackRock, which together manage over three out of every $10 invested anywhere in the world, all committed to redirecting investment based on the Paris Climate Accord goals because they see the risk of being shackled to such a system. And so they're seeking to invest in a new drawdown economy that places market value on those things that stabilize our climate instead of disrupt it further. Predictably, smaller scale investors are flocking in their wake. Let's help them bring money back down to earth by putting it into our communities. You don't have to be an accredited investor to play a part, as Michael Schumann's book, Local Dollars, Local Cents, shows. So if this is your calling within your Communities Guild, read that book and Woody Tash's Slow Money and open a Slow Money Investment Club, um, as Ed and Vardy and the Farm Collaborative did in Aspen with the Two Forks Club. These investment clubs are financing the food shed by distributing zero interest loans to local organic farms and small food enterprises. Lastly, let's reclaim common ground for the common good. There's so much public space in our land and the vast majority of it goes untended. It's time to take it back for the people. Get inspired by the sudden emergence of hundreds of climate victory gardens and public food forests around the country. Here's my guild led by CMC students, starting one in Carbondale. And let's not forget about the federal land agencies that surround us or whose land surrounds us. On day one, the Biden-Harris administration directed the USDA to do something it's never done before, finance and incentivize climate smart farming and land management practices by establishing new financial tools like a carbon bank to fund rural community grants. The NRCS is a part of the USDA and will certainly play a part in that effort. Biden's team is also calling for the creation of a citizen climate corps to put youth to work as did FDR's civilian conservation corps which planted 3 billion trees as part of a new deal. So heads up that carbon farming is not only physically possible, as this excellent book shows, but it's also about to become more feasible financially. In summary, um, reaffirming our alliances with the great diversity of living carbon in the topsoil and with the wondrous variety of carbon life forms above ground is the free, really the, the main key to freeing ourselves of the dependencies that threaten our sovereign right to feed ourselves now and into perpetuity. Here's a cheat sheet I promised, uh, which I will share with you along with this slideshow. And with that, I, I hope I gave you more questions and answers and I'd be glad to, to take any you'd like to fire my way if we have any time left. Um, Adrian, this is uh, Susan Wyman, and I wanted to thank you for that just beautiful presentation. Um, I should admit that I almost started crying when I thought about the people we see that act as pollinators and those that are shading the work that we're doing and those that are the legumes that are working underground. It's really incredible. Um, so this was pretty inspiring, and I think that we're moving direction in the Gunnison Valley, clearly. And of course, we all have a ways to go. Uh, but I thank you for, for sharing this incredible information. We've had a couple of questions come to Q&A. I'm going to read one from uh, William Lee. My question is, how is this scale 
from a few independent farmers in areas with ample water resources, time, and room to go grow crops up to feeding the world. Given that the world population only grew to its current level on the back of the unsustainable capitalist food production system, how can we move away from it while still preventing famine? Great question. Well, yes, the Haber-Bosch process that allowed us to uh, fix nitrogen into a liquid form is often credited uh, with the fact that the human population was able to grow so big in the 20th century. Um, at the same time, we lost most of the farmers that were growing food at that time. So simply put, I would say we need more farmers and we need to make better use of the land that we have, including the public land. And by that, I mean, we need to activate its potential. Uh, now that we understand the soil food web, which we did not when uh, those agrochemicals were first uh, invented, we did not understand how nutrients flowed into plants at that time. Remember Sir Albert Hart Hoffman, who's sort of thought of as the godfather of organic agriculture, he didn't have the tools to prove his hunch, but his hunch was right on. His hunch was about the mycorrhizal fungi and the, the critters that were living underground and the beautiful complexity of that. Um, and so at this point, 90 years of scientific research have proved him right. And I would argue that 90 years of evidence from the industrial food uh, experiment <laughs> has shown that fertility decreases with that, with that approach. Uh, over time, we lose soil. We lose the, the fertility in the soil. So even though we can artificially boost production on a short term, and that's really impressive because we're using essentially bombs, right? Ammonium nitrate was uh, developed to be a bomb to kill people. Um, it's really good at doing that in the soil as well. Uh, it also makes our plants super lazy. They don't have to partner anymore with the, with the soil food web. They get to just have these straight infusions of crack. So that's a dependency model that may boost us artificially in the short term, but it doesn't feed humanity over the long run. That's a wonderful answer. Um, does anyone else have questions for Dr. Fielder? Well, I think uh, we don't have any additional questions coming in the Q&A. We've got a few more minutes if you do want to post those questions. Um, I will say uh, that that response to William Lee is pretty amazing. When I began as a backyard gardener over 30 years ago, I didn't understand the slow food web. Um, and my father used seven, which is a number. That's a toxic chemical. And he used that to control pests uh, in our backyard garden. And if we farm is completely organic and I can see the transition of the species, if the aphids come in, then the butterflies follow. Um, if the uh, wireworms are there, pretty soon the ground beetles show up or army cutworms, the ground beetles. Nature shows up when we need her. And if we can learn to live with that synchronicity, it is powerful and incredible. Um, so I too at one point wondered if, this, if any of this was scalable, um, but what Big Ag is doing now is certainly not sustainable. So what options do we have? So, all right, um, we've got just a couple more minutes. So I think that you may have answered that well earlier, uh, Dr. Fielder. I liked all the little forks and, and our fork for the Gunnison River Valley. Do you wanna say anything else about um, the food shed? Um, just that, it, that it, it, it takes work to build these relationships, so. I look forward to coming out and visiting you all. Thank, thank you for inviting me. I, I feel uh, called to come and, and get to know you now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we'll just all thank you for your time today and we'll uh, move over. At this point, folks, we have two different tracks. 
Uh, you can choose track one where Jeff Dotrick is going to talk about food presentation and, um, and fermenting. And the uh, second track will be moderated by Alexis. And that, is, that track is going to start out just now um, with uh, cooking with a seasonal balance at 9,000 feet by our local uh, wonderful chef, Dana Zobs with Crested Butte Personal Chefs. So look for the Zoom links that you were sent by Dana. And if you want food uh, pre preservation and fermentation, stay in this Zoom room. And if you want cooking with a seasonal balance, uh, hop over to the other Zoom room and keep in mind, again, all of these will be recorded. So you'll be able to look at them on the uh, YouTube. Uh, the Gunnison Valley Producers Guild's brand new YouTube channel. Okay. Thanks everybody. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much.